Well, hello everybody, and welcome to the fabulous island of Lanzarote. Some people call it Lanzarote, I'm not sure why, perhaps because it has a reputation of being a bit barren. To me, it's no more barren than any of the other Canary Islands, because of course they're all volcanic, right? So, in this video, I'm going to show you my six favourite things to do here on the island. It's very exciting, the sun is just starting to shine, the clouds are just starting to clear, it's mid-December and it's 20 degrees. And there's also some aircraft flying overhead because we're not far from the airport. So let's go check out Lanzarote. Stay tuned. So to start the day off, we're going to take an e-scooter ride down to find somewhere to get breakfast. I'm in Porto del Carmen, the original resort in Lanzarote. It was here in the 70s that all these hotels sprung up and kick-started the tourism industry right here on the island. After that, we're going to go and see an abandoned hotel. And if you've seen my previous videos, you'll know that the Canary Islands are littered with developments that have just stalled, closed, and just been left to rot. And then, coming up, we're also going to see Island Sun, Cesar Manrique's Volcano House, which is sort of a shrine to probably the most popular guy down here in the Canaries, particularly his home island here in Lanzarote. And then, coming up after that, we're going to go see the Cueva de los Verdes, the caves, Mirador del Rio, which has got some really great views over La Graciosa, which is the eighth Canary Island. And then, to finish off the day, we're going to go to Montanas del Fuego, which is where we're going to have lunch cooked over a live volcano. Really good stuff. I'm really excited. So let's go check out Lanzarote. So one of the first things I'm going to do, though this isn't in the top six, is to climb up what is called the Mirador Puesto de Socorismo, and I've pronounced that probably all wrong, but my notes tell me here. It's a great tower with a great view in a nice atmosphere, and then into the sea. And they're kind of right, really. So this is basically it. So from here, we've got great views just over there towards the airport, and then out to the sea and then just behind me here is basically Porto del Carmen which goes on for miles and miles when I first stayed here as a child when I was probably about five or six years old and none of these hotels were here and this really was the birthplace of tourism here on the island of Lanzarote so if I can figure it out I'm going to try and hire one of these bikes so these are all around Porto del Carmen, and in fact all around the island in certain places. Uh, you can't park them anywhere, you have to sort of pick them up and park them in different places, but I'm going to try and give it a go and see how we get on. Let's try this one here. You just go into the app, and it should just load up. Uh, so you scan the barcode on the bike. When the LED is white, go. So we've got a white LED, which is good. So let's get going. And I'll try and do this one-handed, which is probably not going to be very easy to do. But let's give it a go and see how we get on. <laughs> well, this is certainly very different. Let's take this kickstand up. That's it. And we are off. And what they've done here is resurfaced this since the last time I was here. So it's a nice smooth drive drive ride uh, and all you do is once you've got the white led there you push that down to get traction that's the brake you've got brake on both sides and away you go and they are quite fast as i'll show you so uh apologies this may be a bit bumpy this is not easy to do one-handed with the camera and there we go and we're off so hopefully you can see this but uh they are quite fast <laughs> Oh my word, keeping an eye out for pedestrians. And hopefully you can hear this with the wind noise as well. There's not too much wind, but uh, you see we've got a pedestrian here. You've got to keep an eye out for these people. Thank you very much. And away we go. So they keep the bikes mostly away from the pedestrians, as you can see. But this is a very, very fast and efficient way to get around Porto del Carmen. And it has to be good for the environment. It's got to be better than driving, right? The thing is, folks, before you all say it, 
because I know somebody will, is, yep, I haven't got a crash helmet on. And I am a very safety conscious person. You should have a helmet on, really. Folks, I forgot to bring mine. I do a lot of cycling at home. And I did mean to bring my crash helmet, but I didn't. So if you are going to use them, I would recommend don't do as I do. Bring a helmet, because they are quite quick. So this is the e-scooter super pedestrian i think that's what the company's called that i sort of rented it from and it's really cheap i'll show you the bill in a moment so you, when you scan it, it i think it holds 10 euro on your card and as you can see we're even going faster than the cars here so i'll try and get on camera for you oh there's a tree keep an eye out for the trees keep an eye out for the pedestrians on the left ah that car's overtaking me now <laughs> but still it's a very very nifty way to get around so I've just seen somewhere where I can park up the scooter, which is what I'm going to do now. And uh, I'll park it up, and then I'm going to go find somewhere to, break, to get breakfast, and we can have a look at, see how much it was. So let's just park it up here, with its brothers. There we go. And then I think, in the app, you just close off the ride in the app. I think. Let's just have a quick look. So if we we're in the parking area, so it's telling me I'm in the parking area, which is correct. Let's finish that. Do you want to finish? Yeah. To end your ride, take a photo confirming proper parking to avoid a fine. So let's take a photo. Let's thinking about it. There we are. So ride ended. So that total was two euro, three euro. Uh, I think. So fair total, €2.45. And then with my 50% discount, it should have been 490 That's right, yeah. So it should have been 490 But it's actually taken 245 off with the December discount code. I think that's absolutely brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. What a cracking idea that is. So we're here more sort of now in the really old part of Porto del Carmen. And just dropped the bike off there. You saw how simple that was. I was really impressed, really genuinely impressed with that. It was good fun. My arms are aching now though a bit because whilst they are sprung to soften the ride, the suspension really hits you. It's sort of like, you know, your hands are sort of, your hands are taking a pounding. And I suppose the faster you go, the harder it gets, but, uh, so to speak, I mean on the bike. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so the sun's come out now. Beautiful, I've got my hat on because you don't have as much hair as I once did. So let's take a quick look at the beach. We've just got some nice mountain views in the background there. And then we'll go find some breakfast and I'll show you what I'm having for breakfast. Which is not that all exciting because Porto del Carmen being popular with the Brits means it's littered with restaurants that serve cheap full English breakfasts with a coffee or a cafe con leche. There you have it with the mountains in the background and that mist is just starting to lift. It was thick fog when I drove over here because my hotel is around the other side of the island. So we just descended when I was about 700 feet into thick, really thick fog. But that's now lifted and I'm hungry and the time now is... Oh, my Apple Watch is telling me I should record an outdoor cycle. <laughs> So yeah, sure, let's take the credit for that, yeah. 14 minutes, 1.47 miles, heart rate 121 beats per minute. Is that good? I don't know. Right, onwards we go, my friends. So find that full English breakfast. Oh yes, 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 yes. See, there's just, see what I mean? There's just sort of restaurant after restaurant just catering to the Brits who, first thing they do, and I count myself here of course, I'm not dissing anybody, because I'm exactly the same, you fly 2,000 miles, four and a half hours on the plane, first thing you do on a morning is look for the full English breakfast, well I do anyway. Well friends, that was good fun, I must admit, I'd highly recommend the scooters, but do wear a crash helmet, I'm not lecturing you, 
it just would have felt that bit safer to me to have had a helmet on. But before we go on to attraction two, which is one of my favourite pastimes here in the Canaries, to go urbexing, urban exploring, to see some of these abandoned hotels, and there's a big one that I'm going to show you next. Let me talk to you very quickly about the great cash machine ripoff, because I don't ever carry cash with me. So I've experienced this for the first time myself, although I'd heard about it previously. So the way it works down here is that if you're from Britain, you'll be largely used to having free ATM withdrawals from most of the large banks with your debit card. So where I went for breakfast this morning, a lot of these smaller places don't take cards. And that's fair enough. The small businesses, they can do without the overheads of card processing fees. Absolutely fine. So I went to get some cash. First of all, I went to the BBVA cash machine, a Spanish bank, and they wanted seven euro fee just to take 20 euro out. Plus, they tried to do that dynamic currency conversion, which is to exchange everything. They give you a GBP figure and tell you it's easier to do it like that. What they're actually doing is giving you a terrible exchange rate. So always pay in euros, and if you're taking cash out, choose the euro option. So your bank sets the rate, which will always be massively better than, than down here. So I went to BBVA, didn't want to pay the seven euros, so I thought I'll go to the Santander machine. So I went to Santander, and the, their machine still wanted six euro. So I had to pay it. So what I did was I took out a bit more cash to try and soften the blow of the fee, you know, try and spread the fee out a little bit. But really, seriously, um, always take your cash out or, or get currency in the UK, whether it's from somebody like TravelX or one of those. Anyway, onwards and upwards. Let's go see the abandoned hotel that is apparently haunted. We'll see when we get there. Hello everyone and welcome back to part two of the video which as you can see is the abandoned hotel otherwise known as the Atlante del Sol. This has been here since I think the 70s when it was abandoned and if you've seen my previous videos you'll know that abandoned buildings are rife across the Canary Islands and I'll explain why as we take a tour around so in practical terms what you can do is you can park your car not far from here it's quite an easy drive it's on sort of mostly tarmac roads until about the last half mile or so so you park your car some way further up the road and the parking is obviously free and it's largely an unattended area lots of tourists lots of cyclists lots of people just out walking nobody really bats an eyelid and then from there you park your car and you walk the last half mile. You can drive to it. You can drive to it if you want to risk it in your hire car. But because it's so... Some of the uh, volcanic rock is, is so sharp. It's not something I wanted to do. So we've just decided to park the car a little way and walk down. Like I say, you could bring your car, but you are risking a puncture. And uh, yeah, so it's... Uh, 23 degrees and as you can see barely a cloud in the sky with the mountains just in the back in the range there in the background and I'm having to keep an eye on where I'm walking as well because it is very sharp some of the rocks as rocks are but for the time being let's go check out the Hotel Adelante del Sol and I'll tell you the story behind it that people know that is you know things that are generally acknowledged nobody knows the true story about what happened here but uh, let's have a look around and I'll tell you about the three myths the three stories that it could be three potential things that it could be so the thing to bear in mind with all of these kind of buildings that are dilapidated and not attended and not maintained anymore is a lot of them are fenced off but because of the interest in buildings like this with urbexers and i'm just a sort of part-time amateur urbexer there are people who do it for a living there are openings there are always openings in the fence and you can see a few here that have just been torn down over the years this is very very interesting this is one that i wanted to visit for a long time and my understanding is that some people have actually moved in here and there are potentially second generation families living here in a transient 
sorts of lifestyle. So as you can see, in common with every other building that's abandoned in the Canaries, it over time becomes heavily vandalised. People wanting to put their mark on the building and as I said, as far as we know, this building's been stood here since the 70s. And I'll tell you the first theory as we walk through. These are such eerie buildings when the wind's blowing through. It reminds me of the video that I did on the leprosy colony in Tenerife, and I'll pop the link above it if you've not seen it. As you can see here, look, if I can get it on the camera, the entire fabric of the building has just collapsed. I'm not sure if the camera's picking it up, but basically the concrete roof with the girders has just fallen in completely. And I guess the rest of it will just go in the coming years and decades. You see what I mean, just by that hole in the floor, you've got to be so careful when you're wandering around these buildings because anything underfoot can just give way and of course there's no handrails, there's no just fall in there. It's not quite like good old health and safety Britain, which if something like this was around, as soon as it's closed, it would be sealed off and bulldozed and before you know it, you'd have a trendy wine bar or flat. So that's probably a better view of what I was trying to explain earlier. That would have been an entire floor of the hotel facing out to the sea that's just collapsed, completely collapsed and just left. And the Canary authorities know full well about buildings like this. There's lots of them. I could name five in Tenerife off the top of my head. And it's just being eroded constantly. It's very exciting, but eerie at the same time. You can see where the bedrooms were going to be. And I presume these were the premium sea view bedrooms. Not looking very premium now, I dare say. So I'll find a spot for us to pop the camera down and then I'll tell you about the first of three theories as to what happened here. So the first theory, and probably the most plausible, about this building is that a German businessman wanted to build a Donald Trump style Turnbury Golf Resort started building the hotel without planning permission and without doing much research. If he'd have done his research, he would have realised that you're actually building on fairly arid land. Nothing grows here. And that goes the theory that he started building the hotel and when he realised that he didn't have any water or any significant water or rainfall really to keep the golf greens lush as is required, as is basic stuff if you're building a golf course. He left, returned to Germany and went bankrupt, never to be heard of again. Now that's probably the most plausible theory, but theory two we'll come back to in a short time. But as you can see, the bathrooms were tiled. He got a long way in building his dream hotel. He just couldn't put a golf resort here because so goes the theory. The arid land just wouldn't support it. There isn't any water or not enough water, despite the fact you're by the sea. What you need apparently is rainwater and fresh water to run a golf course to keep the grounds lush. And when he realized there wasn't any, he got on board a jet and flew back to Germany. I think that's probably the most plausible theory. I don't want to wander too far down here because as you can see, I think this is where the people are living and obviously I don't want to disturb their abode as basic as it probably is. Although with good sea views, people are living here I'm told and I don't want to 
upset them or offend them, even though they're probably living here illegally, but have been doing for years. And again, lots of rumours and myths about this site. Apparently there are second generation transient people living here, that is to say, people who were born here from existing residents. Oh, this place, this place is like this, excuse me, the creeks. As fascinating as they are, all you can hear is the wind and my footsteps. These places are so eerie, they really are. I'm not sure why I'm whispering. Perhaps just to the effect. Gosh, I mean, fabulous sea view is really, really great sea views, but boy, oh boy. than potentially those people who are living over there, taking a midday siesta in their bijou flat. But you can see how far advanced the building was. There was every intention of running this as a bona fide hotel, as a Turnberry type golf resort, just by the sea. And if it had have paid off, it could have been tremendously successful because location wise, it's fabulous. You're not near the airport, so you're not going to get many aircraft going overhead. But yeah, wow, look at this. I mean, it's just so eerie. Eerily quiet. Eerily abandoned. And I like using the word eerily. So in the 70s, here on the islands, not just here, but in all of the Canary Islands, following the death of dictator General Franco, the hoteliers from abroad went into overdrive. They couldn't build hotels fast enough. And so a lot of hotels were built without planning permission on the assumption that they would get planning permission. But that wasn't the case. And General Franco had a real tight grip, as most dictators do, on Spain, the Balearics and the Canaries. And so the theory which is perfectly possible, is just that. Our German friend came here as an architect, developed this, what potentially could have been a fabulous hotel and resort, but ultimately didn't get planning permission. But more than that, he was told to leave the Canary Islands, so went back on a jet to Germany. Perfectly possible. And I'll tell you about theory three, which is the most outlandish, in a little while. The third theory, and the final theory, which is the most ridiculous, but I'll say it in a lower voice for dramatic purposes, is that one night our German architect friend was working late. It's late December, just after Christmas, and he's wanting to get his new resort open. Clearly, it needed windows, but apart from that, work was progressing at pace. It's eerie, just like now. You can't hear anything for miles around. And suddenly, our German friend's tools start moving. Without logic, without reason. Our 
our German friend, as you'd expect. Light at night, late December. It's eerie, it's quiet. He's getting a bit spooked by all of this. And so goes the theory that this hotel is built not on sacred land, but on possessed land. And he was kept. He not only left his resort, went bankrupt, didn't just leave the resort, didn't just leave Lanzarote, left the Canary Islands, and flew back to Germany. So the third theory, is it true? No, let's be honest. But does it make for a good story? Oh yes, very much so. Very much so. On that note, let's head out now. Probably for a drink, quite fancy a drink now actually, having cleared this yet another eerie abandoned building here in the Canary Islands, which I love doing. So on that eerie note, we're going to go now to the third spot of the day, which is one really very well seeing, the Cesar Manrique Volcano House, which is part of the Cesar Manrique Foundation. Now, as I said at the beginning of this video, Cesar Manrique was not only celebrated as the island sun, he is synonymous with the Canaries, but particularly Lanzarote, because this is where he lived right up until his death. And we'll explore a bit more about the man himself, and I have huge respect for Cesar Manrique for all the reasons that I'll outline as we explore part three of the six amazing things to do on the island of Lanzarote. Let's go. So third on the list of places to see while you're down here in Lanzarote, in fact, a must see in my opinion is the Cesar Manrique Volcano House, which is now the Cesar Manrique Foundation. This is where island son Cesar Manrique lived until his death in 1992, sadly involving a car crash. So this is a celebration of what was more commonly known as the island sun. It was Cesar Manrique who decried in the Canaries some years ago that no building should be higher than a palm tree. And of course that's not truly enforced, but that's one of the reasons why you only ever really see low-rise hotels on the island and low-rise buildings because Cesar Manrique, being the passionate architect of Lanzarote that he was, had a huge influence on how buildings were not just designed, but the space that they occupied. So I'm very interested to see Cesar Manrique's own house that he developed, designed, built himself, because I think it's probably very similar to how I would design a house, and I'll tell you why as we have a look around. In many ways, Cesar Manrique was regarded as eccentric, a bit of a lunatic, and that was because all the ideas that he had at the time, like so many famous artists and architects, get trashed by the media. And he went through a period of depression because people just didn't always believe in his ideas. But just looking around his house here, you can see just how Everything just flows naturally and in a nice Canarian style that he himself authored to, in many respects. I mean, if I was going to design a house, it would include a swimming pool with this nice waterfall feature here as well. It makes absolute sense and it's in the shade despite being in the heat. And it's here where we descend down into literally the man cave and it's said that this is where Caesar Enrique did some of his best work and would often spend days down here and in Britain we all joke about having a man cave as in somewhere that the man in the marriage can go for some quiet peaceful reflection and this the man cave is it this is where it's said he spent days and days doing some of his best work so much of it trashed by the media. But on reflection, genius, absolute genius. You wouldn't want something like this. I mean, it is just genius. It is so wonderful. The chairs just sitting there, swinging in the wind. You can see why I loved living in Lanzarote and how we developed this property which his idea was that all properties should look like this in Lanzarote and of course not everybody had that sort of resource that he had because 
by the time of his death in 1992, he was worth millions. But I suppose deservedly so. This is absolutely the place I would develop if I was ever lucky enough to develop my own house from the ground up. This would be it. In another world, he could have been an evil genius, like on a Bond film, in a horror at Volcano. But he wasn't. He was just a genius architect. Just. So let me just quickly tell you about the next video before this plane comes across, which is the Caves of Lost Verdes, and that's where we're going next, which is attraction number four of six, must see things here on the Grand Island of Lanzarote. We've got a three centre ticket. I'll pop some details down below. It's cheaper to buy the three centre visits to cover the north of the island. I'll go into some more detail in a little while, but for now, let's go in and see what the Cueva de los Verdes is all about on this rather windy day. And so I briefly mentioned it earlier, but if you're going to come here and see a few of the different sites, like the Cactus Garden, the caves here, and possibly Tim and Fly or other places, then I'll leave a link to the website below, because if you buy your pass in advance, uh, they just send you a PDF and then it just gets scanned as you come through and you can sort of choose three or four centres and it's quite a decent discount so I paid for the three centre ticket €23.50 which if you pay individually as you arrive at the different places the equivalent would have been paying individually €27 Euro. so you just get it's a fair discount and I'll say I'll leave the link down below and it's well worth doing if you're touring around the north of the island and you might want to go to Tim and Fire which is what we're doing next as well as perhaps the Cactus Garden, Mirador del Rio which we're going to see as well in this video. Hello. Hi. There we are. Thank you. Just me. One people, yeah. <laughs> so you've, uh, you've really got to watch your head when you're coming down here it's of course because there's 50 people ahead of us. It's moving quite slowly. Yeah. If you're claustrophobic, this isn't the best part of the town. So as I say, you uh, you do have to watch your head and your footing because there's literally nothing down to the right there you wouldn't want to slip and fall down here i guess but it is well rendered in the sense that the tour guide said that this particular path has been adapted for tourism essentially and it really has Obviously, they've done a great job bringing people here, and this is a very popular attraction. We only walk about one kilometre of this whole tunnel. I think the chap said it was just over five kilometres long, but the public only walks one kilometre. I think he said the tour lasts about 45 minutes. And if you didn't have the pass to do this tour, it's 10 euro. This is incredibly stunning. Obviously all of these lights wouldn't be here ordinarily. But what they've done for the tour is pretty good. Albeit you do have to duck in the parts. Oh, this is low. Yes, it's very low in certain parts as we can see. But that said, the majority of the tour is open like this so yes you do have to squat down in parts but most of it is very open as you see here and so what he's actually saying there is that what you're looking at here is there's a bit of a build-up and it's, it's actually quite good so because the water's so still here and with the light reflecting off it the build-up is that there's a 20 foot drop where you're looking down there. It's actually not, it's actually a lake and there's just water in there and to prove it they throw a pebble in. 
but when it's perfectly still, it looks like you are literally stood over with no protection, looking over into a 20 foot drop. It's very good. It it's certainly adds me anyway. It's not difficult to be fair. So, uh, looks like we can see daylight now. Coming towards the end of the tour of the caves, therefore. Yep, that's definitely daylight. So that was Cuevas de Los Verdes and my hat's about to blow away. It is so very windy here as is normal in the northern part of Lanzarote. It was good, it was really worth seeing and I've seen this a couple of times now. I've got to be honest, I've got to say this for your own information. It's obviously not for everybody. If you are in any way mobility impaired, or if you struggle with bending over, if you're going to get neck pains, things like that. There are some really, really tough parts to these caves, unlike other caves that you might have been to, like the caves of Drac in Mallorca. So this isn't the simplest labyrinth of caves to walk around. That said, if you are able-bodied and you're not going to struggle with anything that you've seen in there on the video today, it is well worth a visit, it's well worth coming. It's only 10 euro and if you're going to see a few of the sites, like I said earlier, use the link below and get a discount for three or four of the sites in, in the northern part of the island. So, what we're going to go and see next is attraction five on the tour of Lanzarote, which is Mirador del Rio. And I'll explain a bit more about Mirador del Rio when we get there. It's just a short drive from here. Well, what is it they say about the best laid plans? So here we are at Mirador del Rio and I haven't got my sunglasses on because I kind of don't need them. Unfortunately, because of the weather today, we have nothing but rolling in full mist. Hard to watch. I am at an elevation of just 1500 feet above sea level, so not that high. Nevertheless, unfortunately, I did want to show you the views over to La Graciosa, the eighth Canary Island. But unfortunately, I can't. The good news is that next year I will be spending a few days on La Graciosa, so I'll show you around properly then. This is uh, inside of Mirador del Rio, and I'll show you what I can. The chap on the desk I just said today, you cannot see anything. But uh, as I bought a ticket, I thought I might as well use it anyway, of course. So ordinarily, you would be able to see for miles and miles, and it's so picturesque, and I'm so disappointed I couldn't show you it today. But once you see La Graciosa when we get there in January, it'll be worth the wait, I can assure you. But for today, I just can't show you this attraction, unfortunately, because as you can see, it just there is just literally fog sweeping around, being blown around by the wind. It's a, just a pretty unpleasant day at the moment. <laughs> one of those things, one of those things, viewers, that's, that's life. You can't predict the weather. So up here, you've got two windows, which would normally be the eyes of the world, I guess which is uh, just beyond the glasses of the cafe. But that's it. That's literally all I can show you, unfortunately. It is a fabulous attraction, even though I can't prove it to you today. But at least we can say we came. At least we can say we all saw the fog together. Attraction six, of course, being Tim and Fire. And certainly, hopefully, that'll be a bit more entertaining than here. And so, welcome to Tim and Fire in the Montanas del Fuego, the mountains of fire. This is the sixth and final must-do trip when you're here in Lanzarote. As far as I'm concerned, there are other trips that you can do. And if you like the Canary Islands and if you love the Canary Islands as much as I do, you don't have to love me, not many people do. But if you love the Canaries, then do me a favor and click subscribe because I've got lots more content coming and in the new year I'll be spending a few days on La Graciosa, the 8th Canary Island, not far from here and somewhere that isn't really represented very well here on YouTube so I'll be bringing you lots of information about that particular island, the 8th Canary Island. 
So back to Tim and Fire today. So this is sat on a live volcano. It's not, it is dormant in the sense that it's not about to erupt and start spewing, covering me in hot lava. But you can have your food cooked on the heat coming up from the ground. And I'll show you in a moment a couple of things that they do here. So one of the things that they do is they put uh, dry hay down into a deep shaft which then produces flames and ultimately the other rather neat trick and it is quite groovy is they pour water down a uh, funnel and then of course water fire you get steam shooting up so this is great so what I'm going to do is I'll show you that first and then hopefully hopefully I'll try and get some food cooked on the heat from the ground in the restaurant just behind me there but before we go and have a look in the tourist shop, I want to tell you about these buses. Now, this isn't a bus channel, and we certainly not about this video, certainly not about tourist buses in Lanzarote. But included in your ticket price is a complimentary drive around the area. So you can drive so far in the car, so you get your ticket from the gatehouse about two kilometers away but what you can't do is you can't drive all around the windy path which you can just sort of see down there which I'm just pointing out now and that's reserved for the coaches to preserve the natural beauty of the national park here but it is included in your ticket price and a lot of people don't realize that buses depart quite regularly I don't know if you'll be able to see it on the camera but the bus is very very far in the distance it's a good 45 minute tour around uh, with some useful information so don't forget to do that while you're here it is included in your ticket price of 12 euro which you just pay at the gatehouse and then you as i said you take a two kilometer drive up here park your car and then see the guy do his fire tricks have some lunch cooked over the hot furnace and don't forget to take the coach tour there he's just put some I guess it looks like hay I suppose that he's just popped down into that cavern and then in a few seconds you'll see it start smoking and then the flames will just come up it's, uh, it's really fascinating it's uh, what he does so here he is just popping some more in there I don't know what to say, what to do, how to make you see This is nothing in real life, it might just have been a bad dream You can run, you can hide, but you can't put the blame on me Because you're acting like a volcano Well, that was really good fun, but somehow I seem to have joined a Spanish tourist group. <laughs> so I have no idea what they're talking about, but you get the gist, you know. They pour the hot water down the funnel, it mixes with the heat, the steam comes shooting out. It's good, it's fascinating, it's a bit of fun, right? And again, worth seeing. It's worth every penny of the 12 euro. I, th I think it is. And food, chicken actually being cooked live on the barbecue from the natural heat of the volcano below. The heat coming off it is unbelievable. I mean, you can see how the chickens are being cooked there. Very, very impressive. All perfectly natural. So I've just sat down for lunch in the restaurant and ordered, obviously, the chicken cooked over the volcanic grill so really looking forward to that should be really nice just waiting for my friend Sam to return he should be here shortly joining us for dinner so there's quite a decent choice of food here in the restaurant you don't have to have anything grilled off the volcano you can have just ordinary food if you want but I obviously went for the chicken because I just want to try it actually 
taste something that's been made on a volcano, which is a first for me. The restaurant itself is, I mean, it is a tourist trap. It is slightly overpriced. And I'll show you the bill at the end. But nevertheless, the service is really good here. Uh, the waiter and the waitresses are very, very nice. And again, it, it's just a nice place to visit. This is well worth visiting if you can. And you get these panoramic views as you are just sat here eating your lunch, whiling away the hours. It's, it's really nice. My only regret is that because I'm driving, I've had to go with a Diet Coke. A glass of white wine would have been quite nice right about now, and it's because it's three o'clock in the afternoon. Oh, lovely. Thank you very much indeed. Wow, thank you. Wow, well, this looks amazing. Let me show you this. Wow. <laughs> I was just expecting a, a chicken, just, just some sort of ordinary chicken, but we've got uh, a nice green pepper there. We've got some coleslaw. We've got, obviously, the chicken itself which uh, has been marinated in what they call uh, volcanic sauce. And I'll pop the menu up at the end, but wow, look at that chicken, it's so perfect. Wow, let me, let me get some of that sauce, get some of that pepper, some of that coleslaw. Let's see what it's like. Mmm, oh, mmm. It has got that volcanic taste to it, as I expected. A very unusual taste, a very earthy sort of taste to it. But wow, what delicious plate of food. But not the cheapest lunch you'll ever have. So stay with me, I'll show you the bill in a moment. So that was delicious, I have to say, that was a really good lunch. Everything I hoped it would be, the flavours, obviously Spanish food is in my experience, some of the best in the world. But um, overall, it wasn't as bad as I thought. So for the half chicken plus the Diet Coke, it came to just under 20 euro, 19 euro was 80. So, uh, so that wasn't bad. I mean, I never normally spend 20 euro on a lunch. But it's a novelty value, it's a tourist trap. But I've still got no complaints. Very, very nice lunch in fabulous, fabulous surroundings with the panoramic views over the National Park. Superb. Superb. So here we are at the Charco de los Clicos. Some bonus footage for you. The seventh wonder of Lanzarote, I suppose. So the actual lagoon is roped off, as you can see, and the landscape is one of the protected areas of Lanzarote. So you can't touch the water, even if you wanted to. The reason why it has that intense green luxury colour of the Lago Verde is due to the concentration of what's called Rupia Maritima algae, which is present in the water. It is stunning to look at, and it clearly draws the crowds from miles around. So that really is the end of my top six things to do here in the glorious island of Lanzarote. There's more coming, so if you've enjoyed the video, please give me a subscribe and a thumbs up. It makes all the difference. And I'll see you on a future video, probably in La Graciosa. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.